Hello, welcome to Baby Boomer Tales. My name is Jim. Glad to have you with us today. This episode is titled Carpenter Ants. I'm an uncle to about 18 nieces and nephews, and I think I'm a great uncle to about that many great nieces and great nephews also. I'm not really sure how to track cousins, second cousins, third cousins twice removed, stuff like that down. My grandma, my mother's mother, was very good and she could always explain all of that and I have a hard time knowing what's what. But I do know my cousins, I knew my aunts and uncles very well, and I know of some second cousins scattered around. I've done genealogy for about the last two years, and once you get past about two generations, it becomes very cloudy to me. There's some people I've heard of, and some I know a little bit about, but not many. Unless you're George Washington or Thomas Edison, you become lost to time after about two generations. Just the way it is. But don't think that you're not making an impact because every person you touch in this life, you impact them in some way or another. Today I want to talk about my aunts throughout my life, the ones that I knew. We'll start on my dad's side of the family. My dad just had one brother, and those were the only kids, just the two of them, two brothers. And he married a lady named Margaret. And by the time I got to know Margaret, I was probably five or six, my earliest remembrance of her. They lived in New Mexico, and my uncle owned a gamble store. And going to their house was really wild. Margaret would have a maid, and always had a big poodle. These things were as big as a German shepherd. They weren't these little toy poodles. Big old poodle. Margaret liked to have nice things and drive fancy cars, and she always scared me just a little. I don't know why she was always very, very nice to me, but I just think the opulence of her whole environment at her home was so different than the one I was raised in that I couldn't figure it out. Her husband, my Uncle Victor, was a great guy and always had a bunch of stories, and there were always stories about Uncle Victor. He made us laugh and made us wonder, but that was my Aunt Margaret. Somewhere along the line, I really lost touch with her, and she passed away. But the aunts I knew the very best were on my mother's side of the family, since we all basically lived in the same town, and I was raised so close to my grandma and grandpa and my cousins. That was really a huge social circle for me. We'll start with my Aunt Betty. Now, a funny thing about Aunt Betty and Uncle Sam, her husband, was that they bought the gamble store in our town from my Uncle Victor. And then my Uncle Victor started moving around, went to, I believe, New Mexico after he left our hometown. And Aunt Betty and my Aunt Donna, two sisters, married brothers. My Aunt Donna married my Uncle Jim, and he was Uncle Sam's brother. I always thought that was so wild, and how could that do that? And would my brother John and I marry sisters? And all that always ran through my mind. Uncle Jim and Uncle Sam owned the dry cleaners in town before Uncle Jim and Aunt Donna moved to Utah. For a while, they came back. But my Aunt Betty, they lived in a house right below the hill from us. And when we were kids, we used to play around there all the time. There's a lot of kids in the neighborhood around Aunt Betty and Uncle Sam's house. And so there's always a lot of kids. And I have a couple great memories from that house. One of them is putting on plays. You know how kids always putting on little productions at Thanksgiving or wherever there was a family gathering. They'd put on a production. My grandkids still do stuff like that today. And another memory is she was watching us, my brothers and my sister and me, while my mom was gone somewhere. And I remember watching Highway Patrol on the TV waiting for my mom to come pick us up. That's a great memory. I also remember my brother John locking himself in their bathroom and we couldn't get them out. We tried everything. Tried talking them into how you unlock the door. Tried crawling through a little bitty window. They came up with this great plan that they push one of us little kids through the window 
and then they could unlock the door for John, but I was really the only one older, and I think I was too big to go through that window. For hours, John sat there on the toilet with the lid down, saying, I don't know how to open the door. Well, you just do this lock, and you do this, and then you turn the knob, John. I don't know how to do that. John could have still been in there today, but some miracle happened, and he got out of there. Eventually, Betty and Sam built a home up on the hill, and they are a long ways from any neighbors, and so all that playing kind of, kind of came to an end. Most of those kids were younger than me, so what I had in common with them was my cousins there, playing at their house in their yard having lemonade stands and who knows what all we did. I think it was before my Aunt Donna and Uncle Jim moved to Salt Lake. They owned a house kind of starting up the hill. And one day, Randy and I were riding our bicycles, and it was back in the days before the roads were paved. There was this big mud puddle in the middle of the road, about halfway between my house and Aunt Donna's house. And we rode on the, we skirted the mud puddle and splashed water and stuff. Somehow, we got daring each other that we couldn't ride through the middle of that mud puddle on our bike. Now, I can't really remember the particulars of that real well if Randy rode first and rode through it or if I was going first but I remember like it was yesterday I rode through that mud puddle and halfway through it I crashed and I went head first into the mud puddle I was totally soaked totally full of mud mud in my mouth mud in my ears mud in my nose and my eyes it was terrible it was cold and I didn't know what to do Now, I don't know why I did this, but instead of going home, which was uphill, I went down the hill a little to my Aunt Donna's house. And she got me cleaned up, got me warmed up, called my mom to come get me. Aunt Donna was always rescuing me. She taught me how to smoke when I was about 10 years old. That was back in the days people smoked. My dad smoked. My mother never smoked. And one time, Aunt Donna and Uncle Jim were over visiting us, and everybody was outside or something. And I said, Aunt Donna, I can smoke. My dad's cigarettes are right there on top of the water heater. I can smoke them. Aunt Donna said, well, let's see ya. So then I fessed up. I didn't really know how, but I'd like to know. So she said she'd teach me. So she let up a cigarette, then gave it to me and said, now put your lips around this. Now take a big inhale off that cigarette. Now swallow it. Swallow the smoke. And I did as she instructed. And I got so sick. And she thought that was funny. And she told my parents. I don't remember how. But I didn't want to smoke again for many, many years. She really taught me. After she moved to Utah. When she come back. We had this little contest going. Aunt Donna loved to bowl. And I loved to bowl. So our contest was, who can bowl 200 first? Who can bowl a 200 game first? Well, I could bowl 160, stuff like that. I was pretty good. And one day, they were visiting from Utah. There was a new bowling alley in town. It was right outside of town. And so we went over there, and we bowled a game to see if one of us was the better bowler than the other. You have to remember, I was about a 12-year-old kid, and she was a grown woman with a family. But I started hot. I must have been concentrating as hard as I could. I bowled four strikes in a row to start the game. And I thought, I'm going to get this done. Well, I didn't keep bowling strikes or spares, but the 10th frame came up, and I was at 199. I was sweating bullets. I just had totally collapsed mentally. I couldn't get any kind of strike or spare at all. And so my first ball on the 10th frame, I rolled the ball, and I got a gutter ball. Oh, man, a gutter ball. So now I'm really sweating bullets. I've just got to get a pin. I've got to get a pin. So with all my concentration, all my good form, with my special bowling ball that I owned, ball of my own, I did my four steps up there, slid into the foul line, released the ball, and it started rolling, and it started hooking and hooking. It got closer to the pins, and it was hooking, and it was going to go in the gutter, 
and right as it was going into the gutter, it touched one of the pins and knocked it down. And I got a 200 exactly. And I cheered and I jumped and I yelled. And Aunt Donna clapped for me, told me how great a bowler I was. We went up to the front counter and Betty was up there. Not my Aunt Betty, a lady that owned the bowling alley, Betty. And I said, I want a 200 pin like they give you when you bowl 200. And, and Betty tried to explain to me that that's for league play. Well, Aunt Donna spoke to her for a minute and I got my pin. I still got my bowling shirt with my 200 pin on it. I've got that hanging up in the closet here. I also have an aunt named Connie. I've spoken about Connie in several episodes. Connie's five months younger than me. We were raised when we were little, like brother and sister, pretty much. Even in school, it was hard to explain to kids that she was my aunt and I was her nephew. Everybody knew we were related, but if we tried telling the story, everybody kind of, you know, you could wave your hand in front of their eyes. They were so glassed over, they lost concentration on what was going on. To this day, when I see Connie, we do have a bond that is like nothing I ever experienced with anybody else. Because she does feel like my sister, and yet I know she's my aunt. And I still have a hard time wrapping my head around that she's my aunt because we were just raised together. I never have called her Aunt Connie and really never have called her husband Uncle Richard. And I know he's my uncle, but he feels more like my friend or Connie's husband, you know, brother-in-law. So it's a unique relationship that I cherish very much in my heart. My Aunt Jerry lived next door to Grandma and Grandpa with her husband, Uncle Clifford. Uncle Clifford was my mother's brother. And here's the barber in town. I've spoken some of the situations me and Uncle Cliff had. But Jerry and Cliff lived in that house for years. And my Uncle Dick, which was Connie's brother, my mother's brother, Aunt Betty and Aunt Donna's brother, and Uncle Clifford's brother, was really the baby of the family till Aunt Connie came along. Uncle Dick was married twice, Aunt Evelyn, and later Betty Ann. And I never was around Betty Ann very much. But after my Uncle Dick passed away, we went to his memorial service down there at her home in Arkansas. And I got to know Betty Ann a little bit. And now she does feel like my aunt. And I love her a lot. And it was a hard thing. It's a hard thing always. Aunt Betty and Uncle Sam are gone. And before Aunt Betty passed, for about two or three years before, stopped by and see her. And really kind of got to know her in a little different way. After she'd moved out of her home and stuff. And she was just the most charming person in the world. And the last time I saw her and said goodbye, I, I had that feeling that would be the last time I saw her. Uncle Jim and Aunt Donna are now gone. Aunt Donna, I knew that she was growing older, and I, I made a special trip to Colorado to say goodbye to her. She's the most unique person I've ever known in my life. She had the ability to laugh at herself and always stay on the sunny side of situations, something I admired in her a great deal and always wished that I could achieve that myself. Connie's still doing fine. I talk to her periodically. Uncle Cliff now has been gone a very long time. But my Aunt Jerry still plugs along. She has moved over to the eastern side of the Rocky Mountains to be closer to one of her children. I think of all my aunts, Aunt Jerry was the strongest and most resilient. My aunts are definitely carpenter aunts. They helped build a family that was built on the rock of love and fellowship and understanding. Sure, they fought. They were family. But that love I felt from each and every one of them through thick and through thin and the love and the goodness they passed down to their children and that was passed down to their children's children is only a gift of God is the only way I can even explain it. I thank them from the bottom of my heart for helping construct our family in a way that we're all proud of. Kindness is something that doesn't just happen. It takes a person willing to put someone else first. I'll be back next Wednesday.